Five directors are here. You have a quorum. All right, I entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Yeah. Second. All right, item number five public comment. Members of the public may address the board at this time with regards to matters within the board's jurisdiction that are not listed on the agenda. State law prohibits the board of directors from discussing or taking action on items not included on the agenda. Members of the public will have the opportunity for public comment on any item listed. On the agenda, when it is addressed on the agenda, please limit your comments to three minutes or less. Public comments? Oh, I'm sorry. Aye. 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 Thank you very much. <laughs> Trying to move right along. I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda. This is the draft minutes from April 17th, May 1st, uh, special closed. Uh, session on May 15th and the draft minutes on May 15th. I move the consent calendar. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So move, so done. Item number seven presentation by Mojave Water Agency, General Manager Tom McCarley. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. Hold on, sir. And then uh, Mr. Jim Ventura. So I assume, uh, Mr. Ventura, you're going to do some introductions? Thank you. <laughs> I'm, kind of, I'm kind of crashing the party here just a little bit, because, but I couldn't pass up the opportunities. Number one, just to drive down the hill to be here. And number two, I'm also, you know, uh, many years involved with Mojave, uh, with Mojave Water Agency and the relationship with Joshua Basin Water. And I just want to talk just, just a couple minutes. I'm going to take a lot of time you have uh, along with the agenda I see. But, uh, I just want to express, you know, we're in Division Two, and, and Division Two uh, years ago, and some of you were here currently then. Uh, Division Two only covered out the Landers, Landers, and then as the redistricting took place over 10-year periods, you know, now Division Two is 3,800 square miles of the 4,900 square miles of Mojave Water Agency. So it's so so it's a, it's a big area, and uh, uh, there was some intent in that. Uh, when we did some district and I uh, actually uh, fought to get the outlying areas because there was so much commonality between areas like Yermo and Hinkley and Newberry Springs and areas like that and uh, Lucerne Valley. So we have all the rural areas and it's interesting uh, when you travel, uh, everybody has water issues. It's not, it's not just quality, it could be quantity, uh, the access to get water, uh, their systems are deteriorated, or uh, uh, some of that nature where the issue is always the biggest in the community is, is the water. And I want to uh, express my appreciation to this board. Uh, whatever success that we have gained over the last 20 years uh, has been the result of you, this board and the prior board, whoever might have been sitting on this board for the last 20 years possibly, showing up. You come to the NWA meetings, it's a long drive, it's 65 miles approximately, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, it's a difficult road to drive in the evenings in the wintertime, it's, it's very chancy. But just the exposure of you being there show that you're interested and also indicates that uh, you want to make a difference and you want some help in your community. So that's admirable to do that. The time you spend on the road, the time you spend, I don't think a lot of people recognize all the reading you have to do. And under today's rules and regulations, uh, it's very difficult. You have to have a proper staff in place. And that brings me around to Kurt. You know, the first time I met Kurt was, I think it was a water panel at Basin Wide Foundation. 
think you just came aboard. I'm not sure how long you were at, uh, at that time. And so in the introductions, I made this off the cuff remark, uh, Kurt is new to water, uh, but not new to management uh, and organizations. Well, when Kurt came up to talk, his first comment, he probably remembers this, was, I don't know what Jim's talking about. I've been drinking water all my life. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, I think from then and now, now he knows what's in that water. He knows where it comes from, how it gets here, and he's really taking the time to talk to the people that do the work to understand everything that takes place within the water world. So I wanted to express my appreciation for uh, Tom. I think uh, the board uh, brought Tom aboard. That they, he was the right person for the right time. Uh, the organizational management skills that you brought was certainly an asset. And I speak not only as representing Vision 2, but as a resident in Josh Tree. I've been here 39 years now. So uh, just wanted to express that appreciation. And if uh, you would come up, Kurt, if you can get out. <laughs> And we've got this uh, nice little uh, trophy or plaque or something you can put on your desk next to all the ones you probably already have <laughs> or uh, something like that, but it's from Mojave Water Agency. It's dedication, uh, vision, and courage. Kurt Sowers in 2014-2019, Joshua Basin Water from the Mojave Water Agency. June 5, 2019. Mm -hmm. I'm going to present this to you. Thank you very and, much. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to ask Tom to come up so I don't screw it up <laughs> and, and talk about Mojave Water Agency and the things we're doing today. Okay. And the things that you're doing. So, uh, like I said, I'm crashing the party. Uh, so to make sure that I stay on tune and stay understanding what I think I understand, Tom's going to talk about real nuts and bolts for Bob Watering. So well, thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you for your time uh, in your meeting. And uh, I, I guess I, I do want to just, just add on a little bit. Um, I've only gotten the opportunity to work with Kurt for two years. But uh, I've always appreciated your matter of fact uh, uh, and uh, ability to cut to the issue and frankness and uh, really been a pleasure to work with. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so to get to a Mojave Water Agency update, um, I, I thought I'd, I'd keep it pretty simple. Um, just a few topics today. Some are, are pretty big, but uh, one real close to home. Uh, you may or may not be aware of there is a leak on the Mojave Basin, or excuse me, Morongo Basin uh, pipeline. And so we have been shut down. I think it was since Friday, and that um, it was, uh, we had crews out there today digging it up. Um, I haven't gotten a progress update, uh, but uh, it has shut down uh, deliveries into the Morongo Basin, uh, but our crews have, have been all over it and really working on it since uh, Friday. Um, so that's, that's one that's close to home. Um, moving on into the state water project, uh, big picture deliveries, um, it's been really a a fabulous winter and for that matter uh, spring uh, because the spring has been one cool uh, and two it's had continued uh, snow flurries in the Sierras as well as rain uh, it's kept the snowpack uh, in the mountains and it's it's kind of like keeping your reservoir full if you will uh, so it's it's really been wonderful this is one of the best snowpacks at this date we've ever had um, so we've got a 70% a allocation, and so what that means is uh, Mojave Water Agency has a, um, basically a contract to buy a certain amount of water, and that's just under 90,000 acre feet per year. So that would be at 100% of our allocation. So at 70%, we have the ability to purchase 70% uh, of that 90,000. So that works out to be approximately 60,000 acre feet. Um, and we don't have a demand, we being our entire service area, inclusive of Morongo Basin and Joshua Basin, uh, we don't have a demand for that entire 60,000. And so what we try to do is, um, in an effort to increase revenues, to minimize any potential increase in taxes, we try to sell that water uh, when we have the opportunity and we move it in 
uh, to our area for storage and reliability when we don't have buyers. And so uh, you've heard the saying, buy low, sell high. Well, this is a, this is a real low year for, for water uh, because everybody has plenty. So we're moving a lot into our service area. Um, our board has already authorized the movement of, we have an overlap of fiscal and calendar years. So within this calendar year, we're looking at over 12,000 acre feet coming into our service area um, with uh, an additional, I think, four and 4,500 acre feet going before our board next week um, to bring into our area as well. And so just to, just to kind of reiterate what, what that means in a wet year is um, we bring in as much water as we can afford uh, during wet years and we will recharge it. And in the case of Joshua Basin, we coordinate with your staff. Um, so you have the ability to buy as much as you want to buy. And if possible, we'll even use your facility to put water into the ground under Mojave's name such that in a year, <coughs> We had a few years ago, we had a 5% allocation. So that would be a year where there really wouldn't be much for you to buy, but maybe you budgeted to buy water. We would be able to transfer water that's in our name over to you in just a, a paper transfer, but you would maintain ownership so you could still buy the water you budgeted. Um, just an example of how really we can all work together to improve our overall reliability uh, of supplies. Um, just check my notes, see if I'm missing anything. Um, so really, the state water project this year is in is in great shape. Again, 70% allocation is is fantastic. Um, again, one of our best snowpacks at this time ever. And considering two years ago it was the wettest year on record, um, snowpack was not this good at this date. Um, and that was an 85% allocation. So um, we're looking at you know pretty high numbers this year. And so we're going to do the most we can with it. Um, moving on to and. and Feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Um, moving on to the California water fix and really changes associated with um, uh, Governor Newsom. Um, we've kind of been in a wait and see to see which direction um, this new administration wants to go. Um, and uh, I, if, if you may have seen in the press that uh, there was an executive order on April 29th in which the governor declared um, the need for better resiliency in our system, uh, our portfolio approach to planning, um, as well as a, a one tunnel solution uh, for what had been called the California water fix and, and a project that had two tunnels associated with it. Um, but that two tunnel approach couldn't be completed before Governor Brown left office. And so again, it was kind of hanging out there to see where the new governor wanted to go as it was a very passionate project of, of Governor Brown. So moving to one tunnel, um, that's uh, caused some changes um, with environmental documentation and things like that. Um, and I think uh, from that uh, executive order, the um, Department of Water, California Department of Resources, Water Resources, issued um, a few statements uh, relative to the executive order in really try to articulate uh, the governor's view from a water perspective. And, and some of those uh, key elements that came out were to develop um, a water resilient portfolio. We're getting a little more clarity on what was meant by the portfolio approach, but looking at different types of supply if possible. Um, considering needs of the community, the economy, and the environment. And, and I think this is one of the first time we, we've times we've heard all three of those together. And what does that mean for Californians to protect all three of those elements? So the people, the economy, and the environment. Um, and that we need to, it's pretty clear that we need to adapt to climate change, um, as well as we need to assess um, the current system and figure out ways to modernize that system uh, to, again, meet those three needs of community, economy, and environment, um, but also climate change. And, and part of that was the one tunnel approach um, a theme I think we're seeing out of the Department of Water Resources is um, maybe on the, on the coattails of um, Oroville uh, mm -hmm. spillway issues is that it's an aging system. Um, they're going through a process of um, reviewing all of their assets, uh, looking at the, the, the life that's left in those assets and what needs to be done from a, a repair and replacement perspective to keep those assets as long as possible. And so that modernization and updating theme is something we're seeing and, and frankly keeping an eye on from a budget perspective too. And, and I think that's where the, 
the, the single tunnel or what's now being called the Delta Conveyance Project uh, may fall into, um, trying to develop a project that, um, uh, again, meets those three needs, uh, including the environment, um, as well as um, does its best for climate change. So there is a single tunnel project that's evolving. Um, from a long-term perspective, I, I think it's safe to say that um, they're looking at an environmental impact uh, report maybe in the next three years, uh, something along those lines, but a new EIR. Um, again, these are just real rough things we've heard out of EIR, or excuse me, out of DWR, um, and a project to follow. And in the meantime, they're planning to do quite a bit more engineering, uh, outreach, and mitigation planning such that they're a little better prepared within this EIR than they were in the last one. So that's what we're hearing at a DWR for a future project. There is still a project um, on, uh, on board, if you will. Um, and then to kind of bring it back home, um, what does this mean for costs and, and what does this mean for, for really all of us in our service area? Um, I, I like to remind folks that um, agencies like MWA and, and Joshua Basin um, that we don't necessarily, I guess I'll go back to an example where I was once questioned um, why I was supporting development and pushing development. And I, I had to just take a moment to clarify that I work for a water agency and our job was not land use <coughs> planning. Uh, we were to communicate with the land use planners and see what they were planning. And then we go back and we do everything we can to find supply to address that land use plan. And that's the same thing we're going through now in evaluating whether or not we need, we meaning MWA service area, need the Delta Conveyance Project. And with our, our last urban water management plan numbers, we're seeing we do have a shortfall uh, within the next 25 years uh, in supply with the planned uh, economic development. So that's communities, um, that's economy, and again, that's environment um, without the project. And so it is still something uh, from the MWA perspective that we're interested in participating in to meet all the demands of our area, including Joshua Basin. Um, so I hope that wasn't too much and too wordy. But I, I think people need to be reminded where the water agencies fit into the land use process. We're really, uh, you know, how much? And then we turn around with our buckets and go try to find the supply to meet that demand. Um, so let's see. Um, and just I think a last reminder is, it's, uh, it gets a little confusing. I know I've talked to some of you before about our current contract and extensions and amendments and things like that. Um, and a part of the California water fix was a contract amendment. So Mojave Water Agency has a contract with the state to buy water. The state actually has the rights, but we have a contract to buy that water. And that's that 90,000 allocation, 90,000 acre feet allocation. And with the California Water Fix, the two tunnel project, there was actually an amendment that helped uh, Mojave Water Agency um, in transfers and exchanges in selling the water when we didn't need it. And what the state has done, and, and we really appreciate this, is, is within our public negotiations, the state has actually um, broken down that contract amendment to separate California Water Fix and two tunnels, and they've just deleted it all. But they're still moving forward with the contract amendment that allows more flexibility for <coughs> Mojave Water Agency and other agencies like us to buy and sell. And I should say it's two ways. Um, we often work with uh, Central Coast Water Authority. They're often a buyer. They don't have a lot of groundwater storage. Uh, we have storage. We have storage in San Luis Reservoir. So in those dry years, we'll, we often sell to them. So it works both ways. They really appreciate the flexibility too. So my point is that uh, I know I've talked to some of you about a contract amendment and how important it was to us. That piece that was important to us is still moving forward, even though the California water fix is not. Um, so that was a, a lot of information. And uh, I'm available for questions. And, uh, and I, I, I think uh, with the references to Kurt at the beginning, I, I didn't start off uh, very formally. But uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And, and thank you, uh, President of the Board and Board members, for, for having me tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I'll uh, ask the board if they have any questions. Uh, Tom? Start over here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tom, thank you for your presentation. It was uh, informative. I had a question about um, Silverwood Lake. That's a reservoir that you're storing water in, I assume. How does that work? 
Uh, sure. Uh, so Silverwood Lake is a it's a uh, reservoir on the state water project. So within Silverwood is is all project water, if you will. The majority of that water will go to contractors that are downstream, like uh, Metropolitan Water District, San Bernardino Valley, uh, and San Gregorio, as well as San Gabriel. Um, they're all downstream of Silverwood. Um, we very rarely will get uh, large releases from Silverwood that will come down the Mojave River. Uh, we, we can do that. Uh, I say that from a, a, a state project order, if you will. Um, now, to, to separate kind of state project operations and other releases from Silverwood, um, Silverwood is part of a very small drainage into the Mojave River, and when it was created, um, the Department of Water Resources acknowledged that they were going to hold back some of the drainage. And so every year there's a calculation of how much uh, drainage is into Silverwood that would have otherwise uh, come down the Mojave River, and they release that. Um, so we get releases relative to precipitation, but we rarely get our state project releases from Silverwood. Thank you. Yeah, I've noticed the lake is as full as I've ever seen it. It's very nice. They tend to operate it pretty full. Even during a drought, it tends to be pretty high. It's just the way DWR likes to operate it. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. John, that was really interesting about the, well, now it's called the Delta Conveyance Project. <laughs> Sounds like it's not quite dead yet, but it's, I don't know. It, ju it just seems to kind of, kind of go limping along as an idea, as a potential project. I don't know. What, what, do, you, what do you really think is going to happen with that? Yeah, I, I think that's a good time. question. Um, Something to keep an eye on is probably the, uh, there's two joint power authorities that were set up um, to move the project forward. And one is a financing JPA, and that's probably in a holding pattern. And the other is a design and construction um, JPA. And the design and construction JPA is, is moving forward um, with preliminary design uh, as well as mapping out um, how best to interact with those that may be affected, so potential mitigation, things like that. Um, so I'll be watching um, that group to see what happens. Um, but I, I think you said it pretty well that the two tunnel project had a lot of inertia and that's been killed. Um, there's no question about that. And so this Delta Conveyance project, if it has any legs, I, I think we'll probably see in the next 12 to 24 months what, what happens. Yeah. Thank you. That's interesting. I'll uh, entertain uh, questions if there are any uh, from staff and public. Yeah. Staff first. None? I'll have a comment at the later point. All right. Mr. Marquez? Uh, I have a two-part question closer to home here on the Morongo <coughs> pipeline. Uh, you just specified that uh, there was a leak on there. Is there sufficient funds in the water uh, reserve fund uh, from the bond fund to pay for that leak? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, at this time, bond funds are not used to pay for that leak. Um, all uh, repair and maintenance is paid for by Mojave Water Agency. So uh, that's really separated from the bond funds at this time. And the second part of the question I have is that uh, the bond fund is supposed to be uh, completed in 2022 or 2023. Um, there was a discussion about who is going to be responsible for that pipeline after that bond fund is paid off. Uh, is there been any discussion with Mojave Water Agency about who's going to be uh, responsible for the pipeline? I, I think there's been uh, preliminary discussions within the uh, um, within the IDM pipeline. I I've been messing this I up lately. That. Pardon? Can I answer that? Question? Sure, sure. Yeah, yes, you're on the commission. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that that now that concern was brought to the pipeline commission maybe four months ago. Uh, the feeling was from the individuals that uh, the Morongo base and the agency should own the pipeline. And uh, there was analysis that was done by, actually by uh, uh, Marina West and some input from Mike uh, Simpson, who's our superintendent of the Mojave Water Agency. Uh, we just couldn't afford to, th to do that in the Morongo Basin. I think on a yearly basis we're spending seven eight hundred thousand dollars to maintain that system and to see and we haven't we're just now getting into an operation and maintenance uh, 
projects that we have been putting off, and, and several of them on, on the IDM pipeline. So when, that, uh, the, when the bond is paid off in 2023, the ownership converts to Mojave Water Agency. However, let me remind you that uh, we, the Pipeline Commission, which is made up of uh, myself, uh, High Desert Water, Joshua Bay Smarter, the county, and Bighorn Desertview, uh, we have a memo of understanding with Mojave Water Agency on the capacity of that pipeline. So we over here have locked in the capacity, which includes Mojave Water Agency as a portion of that as well. But uh, so anything that takes place on that pipeline in the future will have to go through uh, the pipeline commission because uh, we own the, own the capacity. And I doubt very seriously uh, would any of you sell a piece of your capacity, your capacity in that pipeline. I would say not, and I say under the ownership of Mojave Water Agency, uh, areas like, and the biggest concern has always been uh, Lucerne Valley. Uh, when they had Rancho Lucerne going, they going to connect onto that pipeline. Well, little did they understand, and this is part of the representation you have uh, and the input from board members like you have here, that uh, we're not giving up capacity. And so that, that project, it, wasn't, it didn't stop because of that, but it stopped for other reasons. But they would not be able to, to, to uh, attach that pipeline unless they could have bought some capacity from one of the, one of the agencies. So in essence, uh, we have a say-so after 2023. And by the way, I think the bond is going to be paid off a little bit earlier than that. So uh, we're in great shape right now. Thanks. Hi, uh, you mentioned the leak. Could you give us an idea of where it is and how big it is? I'll do my best, and Mark may even have more information than me. Um, but uh, from what I understand, it's uh, at the east end of, of Lucerne Valley. Um, yeah, just below the Johnson Valley uh, pump station. It, if you recognize where that is. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then the road is where the is. Right, right, right. And and from the leak, um, I am unaware of what the actual flow was because the isolation valves were closed pretty quick and it was shut down. Um, Mark, do you have any idea on that one? No, just the you know, possible location. I think they already had like a mile of drain down already and yeah. a few miles to go, a couple miles to go. So yeah. yeah, the valves are pretty far apart, so it takes a while to drain the pipeline. Sorry, I don't have more specific information. And actually, the Pipeline Commission meets next Wednesday at 2 o'clock somewhere up here. I'm not sure where they're going to meet. It's, I still have to be determined. But that's at 2 o'clock, and it's a very interesting meeting if you wish to come to it. Quite a bit of information on repair and, and maintenance, uh, and there'll be information on the oh, leak yeah. as well. As Mike Simpson, um, our Director of Operations, will be here. Yeah. And I was just looking to see if I have anything more current on the location, but I bet we all have the same invitation, so. <laughs> yeah. To be determined. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, Tom? Tom Clowen here. Um, there's been uh, in the news a lot of um, dialogue about uh, subsidence uh, that has occurred over considerable time, especially well during the drought. And uh, you mentioned that there's a lot of surplus water. Is there any way that this water can somehow mitigate the uh, subsidence, subsidence issues, or is that area by area? I'm, I'm thinking statewide here, which affects all of us. Uh, is, uh, is there any way that this water could be put back down there and bring things back up again? Or is this down condition of these vast land areas just permanent? Yeah, that's a great yes. question, um, and uh, at the risk of being too technical, um, there's two types of subsidence. There's elastic and inelastic, and so elastic, um, like it sounds, uh, it, can, it can stretch, it can move, and it always comes back, and it, it will come back with water, with water levels when you're filling an aquifer, and that tends to be pretty small, and, and we all have that within our, our groundwater basins. Inelastic is uh, really, it's like when you stretch something out and it doesn't come back. It's really just the opposite. You squish something down and the water comes back, but it, 
the, the, the geology doesn't re-expand. And that's typically um, a property of clay material or real fine material. And in this case, where we have subsidence um, specifically along the state project is where I'm most familiar with it. And then there's a lot within San Joaquin Valley. That's where they've got old clay materials, um, or excuse me, old lake bed materials, which tend to be clays. So when, once they're dewatered, they are inelastic, so they will collapse and they will not come back with water um, filling in. Uh, those pore spaces have collapsed and they're, they're gone. So uh, to answer your question then more directly, um, the, the water available this year will not help, even if it is recharged in those areas, it will not help the inelastic subsidence that's occurred. Yeah. We'll have to kind of rebuild what is on the surface to deal with what's occurred. It's really difficult to, to get that up. In some places they can inject a gel and things like that, but this is at such a grand scale, we're really just going to have to deal with um, the inelastic subsidence that's occurred. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Kurt? Yeah, I just wanted to take a minute and say thank you. So <clears throat> I did learn where water came from, <laughs> how it gets distributed, and how it gets paid for. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I couldn't have done what was accomplished here without a supportive board and a supportive staff, just like you all have. You have a great board, and if you would, mention to Yvonne, Michelle, Kathy, Lance, Christy Huner, Daryl, Mike, and Mark, Matt Howard, who have all helped this district immensely in our agreements uh, and moving forward. And thank you for the award. And we have room in our aquifer if you need to <laughs> give us any money or give us any water. For <laughs> 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 both. Yeah. I'd just like to say thank you, too, on behalf of the board. Uh, we appreciate the hospitality every time we make the ride out there. And uh, your staff is great and always accommodating. And thank you, Jim Ventura, for being such a, a stand-up representative for us, too. We uh, really appreciate you. So. With that, thank you very much. You're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, uh, which I'm sure you'll find riveting, <laughs> uh, more exciting than driving home. But if not, uh, yeah. Godspeed, and we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Item number eight, uh, budget approval recommended the board of directors receive report and approve the 2019-2020 budget. Tom, I'll send you the list of those names. Okay. Thanks. Well, unfortunately, I doubt this will be near as exciting as uh, Tom and Jim's presentation, but uh, we're here to talk about something important, uh, the, the budget for uh, the July 1 uh, fiscal year. Um, we presented the budget to both of the committees, uh, finance and water resources uh, committees, uh, last month. And uh, all five board members were either on the committees or in attendance at those meetings. So I think you've all heard um, the, the spiel already. So, you know, we're continuously reviewing this document until it's approved by the board. You know, numbers continue to be finessed. And so there were some, uh, you know, a few minor changes to some of the figures uh, from that presentation. But our bottom line remains the same. Um, so we have, you know, funding for various programs of work, uh, including our new CIRP uh, pipeline replacement uh, work. Uh, we've got money that comes from the loan that we, you know, sources of funding in this budget are uh, that loan, uh, our typical water revenues and taxes, as well as reserves. We use our reserves to do replacement work here at the district. So. Um, we carefully um, analyzed um, cash flows uh, through, uh, you know, 2627, which is actually the, the time frame from the rate study. So uh, we looked long term to make sure that cash flows supported the work that we're, uh, we're doing and that we're not going to, you know, fall off a cliff after next year and, and be out of money. Uh, we used reasonable assumptions of, you know, future costs and work that would be done. Um, you know, there's a lot of challenge in projecting uh, long term, so, you know, the board needs to know that. Even with the best guesses, it is really just that. Um, so it might not always turn out the way that, you know, that we predicted. Um, but there are some things over the, um, 
the not too long term that really free up a, a significant amount of cash you know, over the next few years. So we uh, have funded through the rate study uh, $500,000 per year for our meter replacement program. And our final budget for that is about half a million dollars less than predicted. So when that project is finished, that money will flow back into other capital work. Um, and whatever's left in that fund will you know, be deposited into that fund as well. So that's going to generate another half a million dollars for our capital work going forward. Um, then uh, the final Morongo Basin Pipeline debt service payment is in year 2021 or perhaps even sooner um, or in a lesser amount and that will free up another $220,000 a year for <coughs> other types of you know, capital work or increased you know, operating expenses should that be the case. So you know, uh, nearly uh, three quarters of a million dollars uh, you know, over the next few years. Um, in the short term uh, through fiscal 2021, our projected reserves are still in excess of five and a half million dollars, but they are less than what has been projected in the rate study. Uh, $791,000 next year and $54,000 the following year. Um, then once we hit the fiscal year 21-22 and some of these other monies um, start to get freed up, we are just on an upward path there. There's a big trajectory and uh, you know, reserves uh, in exceed what was projected in the rate study by as little as $318,000 in a year and as much as $2.8 million in other years. So, so those, you know, that three quarters of a million dollars really changes the picture here, you know, in, in the longer term. Um, Let's see. Uh, remember, it's important to recall that we were conducting the organizational assessment at the time that the rate study was going on, and we didn't want to wait for that to finish our rate study. So we have no um, costs associated with implementation of that organizational assessment included within the rate study. So all of that funding for any of those, those items has to come from reserves in the short time or reduction to expenses. Um, or increase of revenues. Um, an example of that is the CIRP crew. So um, we have the loan, which is, has purchased uh, almost all the equipments uh, already, um, and we've got funding for the first couple of projects, project to project and a half. Um, but beyond that, then we've got to come up with the funding for the crew and the materials and all of that, okay? Um, so uh, the year-end, uh, the next point then I guess um, is that year-end projections for this year um, are about uh, $380,000 in the whole. So expenses exceed revenues by approximately $380,000 <coughs> is the projection. That is completely related to the second round of recharge that the district elected to take this year in lieu of next year, all related to some other uh, repair on the, the pipe uh, the Morongo Basin Pipeline, so it'll be shut down for a while. Moving that recharge up saves us $17,000 because the rates go up in July. And next year we will have no recharge in the budget. So next year's budget actually generates $564,000 of net revenue, largely attributable to no recharge next year. The following year, recharge will be right back and we'll use up that you know half a million dollars to buy our, our water. So we're exactly where we should be with the current year budget with the budget that we're looking at next year as well. Um, staff uh, also carefully considered the rate study projections for revenues. Not only do we want to be sure that cash flows are there, that we'll have money, sufficient cash, as we move forward, um, we also need to ensure that we're staying in line with what the rate study has projected or, or we're going to have a problem. Um, so we've, uh, you know, to ensure that uh, we've, uh, that the rates that have been put in place or that are coming, you know, in the next uh, couple of years will provide um, funding for the budget both now and in the near future. So, so we're really comfortable with that. So um, based on, you know, the projected plan of all the operating and the capital work, all the various sources of revenues from reserves and, and our loan and water revenues and taxes, 
Um, we are projecting a total net revenue of $565,000 roughly. So uh, revenues will exceed expenses by over half a million dollars is the projection. And uh, on page 15 of your packet, I did change the, the signs there, so your positives and your negatives, you're not confused with, with our uh, accounting uh, world, so hopefully that's more um, useful for you. And, and I have to say, um, you know, this is the time to appreciate Anne for all the work that she puts into this. Our budget has been steadily climbing over the last few years. Our revenues next year, $8.7 million, so approaching $9 million in revenues. Expenses of $8.1 million, both operating and capital. So that's the total the total package there. So um, a huge, uh, you know, amount of detail associated with working with all the various departments in the organization, hundreds of accounts, uh, you know, myriad um, details and, and um, attention to detail and a lot of moving parts. You know, we just had a, a, a brief discussion as I sat down here tonight and, you know, looked something up, got the answer, but, you know, really in command of all that and, and I want to recognize her for the the effort that that takes and the great job that she does in, in managing the budget um, sure uh, so you know we're happy to discuss this in detail I don't know what the board you know we've got a presentation it, it, you know um, you've seen all this I don't know what level of detail it is that you're looking and, and I'll you know defer to your guidance in that regard well, having a riveting, exciting two-hour meeting uh, with the Budget uh, Finance Committee, I'm sure each and every one would like to go through each line item <laughs> one by one. Like we did. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a, a good time. But, you know, maybe we could do that for Jim and Tom since they're here. And <laughs> they they came all this, way. all this way, gosh. They all this way. They drive all this way, not to hear the presentation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and entertain some uh, questions from the board, and I would like to move that uh, we accept the uh, budget and its presentation and uh, move it for approval. But uh, that being said, comments first, Director Reynolds. Thank you. Um, as Susan, you had mentioned uh, um, we're about minus a half million dollars on the meter replacement uh, in the budget. Yes, yes. Um, that, I, I assume that did not account for item, the potential half million in item. Oh, two. no, absolutely not, because we're doing that one year at a time. Okay. So included within the current budget is only one year's worth of cost. And by the time we get to year five, there probably will be no work in year five. We'll be done in year four, and then whatever, you know, the rest of that money that was funded through the rate study is then available for other kinds of work. So they have nothing to do with one another. That just puts us right in line for the next item on the That's agenda. That's right. <coughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Good clarification. Director I have nothing. Director Hunter? No. All right. Nothing. Oh, come on. Mr. Nope. Nothing. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Aldera, is there any questions uh, from the uh, audience now? And uh, I'll uh, make that motion that we accept the, uh, the budget and approve the uh, budget for 1920. Second that. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So move, so done. Usually Aye. the budget is a long, Almost too easy. drawn out discussion. I'm nervous. <laughs> too easy. Nine. Wait, I was just going to point out they can probably make a copy of the PowerPoint for Jane. <laughs> <laughs> I have it. Yeah, I'll send it home with them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Item number nine, adopt resolution 19997 and resolution 19998 of the attempt to dissolve an improvement district number one and improvement district number two. So we have some house cleaning uh, work to do here. We learned uh, recently that improvement districts number one and two needed to be formally dis dissolved. Uh, it wasn't on our century to glance calendar, sorry. Um, these were formed in the 60s and the 70s. So um, uh, purpose of forming improvement districts is to issue debt so that you can then make the property owners responsible for that debt. So um, improvement districts are formed with public hearings and they have to be dissolved with uh, formally with public hearings. So um, just as reference, uh, ID1 was formed in 1966. We issued 30-year bonds in the amount of $1,060,000 and that was used to build the um, ID number one project up on the you know, south side of Joshua Tree. 
near the National Park entrance. Bonds were paid off in 1996, so I mean it's been decades since they were paid off. We stopped collecting for the debt service decades ago, and we just need to, you know, dissolve the improvement district. ID number two was formed in 1974. Forty-year bonds were issued, and these were used primarily to to build the connections between all of the private water systems that formed the original water district. So, you know, we had dead end lines, and we built the connections. We needed a reservoir over here, that sort of thing. We issued two million dollars worth of debt, and we paid that early. Um, Paid it off early in 2012, saved our ratepayers about $19,000 in interest, and uh, the improvement district's no longer needed, and it also needs to be dissolved. So in order to dissolve the um, improvement districts, we have to issue a couple of resolutions, a resolution of intention, and then a resolution of dissolution uh, for each of the improvement districts. So a total of four will be required. I worked with our um, special uh, counsel, Michael Colantuno, on these, and he wrote the resolutions. So tonight, uh, the resolutions of intention need to be adopted, and they need to include the date of the proposed public hearing within the context, which then needs to be published in the newspaper. Um, due to that, um, you know, the newspaper publication schedule, the earliest we could possibly get these in would be in Saturday's paper, and, and because both of these have to go in the paper, there might not be room, I don't know. Um, and if we got them in Saturday's paper, uh, we could hold the public hearing um, at any time after June 22nd. So the first regular meeting after that would be July 3rd. Apparently that's being canceled. Um, the next regular meeting would be July 17th. That would work. Uh, you know, there's no time frame under which this has to be done after tonight. So. Um, if it needed to be August, it could be that, it, you know, it's not a problem. So whatever date, um, you know, we'll hold the public hearing that night. I presume no one's going to come forth and have any kind of objection. Um, the resolutions pretty clearly spell out that, um, you know, it is not our intention, whereas the board has no intention to affect existing rates and charges, including standby charges, for the water services of the district or other district revenues. So, so there is no intention, you know, no nefarious intention here by dissolving the improvement districts and, uh, you know, probably a lot of the property owners will not even realize that they were ever in an improvement district or, you know, know anything about it. So um, we had to attach a map. That's one of the requirements, and you see that in the packet, as well as the legal descriptions that were from the original resolutions. So these were typewritten on a typewriter back in the 60s and 70s, and we were advised to cut and paste rather than to retype these because the exact wording must be carried forward and you can see how complex this is it's they're not in sentences that you know make any sense per se so so they're kind of not in the best uh, i'm sorry they don't look as you know great um, as as we normally prepare things like this the great job Bev does is at that but um, you know they are as they were uh, recommended to be so you know i'm happy to answer any questions this is you know it's a housekeeping matter and, and we need to get it taken care of so we need the date and then we need the resolutions approved questions from the board um not really uh comment maybe it's a, as you said it's just a matter of housekeeping mm -hmm. um it's my understanding that it will be a basically a four-part operation. We'll bring it to the board tonight to vote for the intention. Then it will go to a newspaper, and then there will be a hearing. Right. And then we can dissolve it. Um, By approving the resolutions of dissolution. Okay. So four resolutions, two for each. Our intent, uh, our resolution of intention really is providing the public notice mm -hmm. of what we're going to do. And then the action really get, takes place at the, the second, okay. at the public hearing. I thought it was actually really interesting. Mm -hmm. And reading through the old language, like a tone poem. Yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> in the that was cool. the northeast corner of Township, one south, east, and meridian, then southerly along yep. the east. Oh, that's They're hard. still written exactly the same way. These are legal descriptions, and they're still, they, they're 
written the same way. Wow. Yeah. I like the word dense. Yeah. Dense. Dense. Yes, right. Yeah. Um, so just a point of clarification, I know um, in the agenda number nine so, you know, says adopt a resolution of intention to dissolve and then list both of them, but do we have to take a separate vote and have a separate uh, motion? And uh, I think second? yes, because that's, they're two separate the I resolutions. It. I guess yeah. unless, the, you, unless either, you can say both prefer, resolution numbers I prefer, I, separate. separate. But you could do it either yeah. way. Okay. And then I just have a comment. When I saw that the second one was formed in 74 and that more than 40 years had gone mm -hmm. by, it was kind of depressing, <laughs> <laughs> given that it doesn't seem all that long ago to me. But. Well, and, um, you know, I wasn't around when these were formed, and so I didn't. And, you were and, a mere and, child. And, right, <laughs> right, and was never um, involved in forming an yeah. improvement district. So I had no idea, you know, what was involved in unforming an improvement district. And, and that's, you know, how this happened, so. Yeah, and I'm, I'm in one of those improvement districts, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm ready to move on. Yes, exactly, <laughs> right. And dissolve it. <laughs> no comment. Uh, questions or comments from the public? So I, I take it though, just for clarification, so there's no impact with water service, quality, any of those issues. This is Zip zero nada. Exactly. Yes. So do we need to read the resolution this evening or do we just need to make a motion to accept? I think just the motion because right. what is required is the publication in the newspaper. There's where people have their opportunity to okay. read it all. Then with that, uh, I'll entertain a, that the board uh, recommend that the board of rec Board of Directors approve the resolution, and uh, do I get a... And we do these separately? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gil is suggesting that we do them separately. Throughout it, so it'd, be, yeah. it'd be cleaner that way. Yeah. I move yeah. then that we adopt resolution number 19-997 uh, of an, uh, resolution of intention to dissolve improvement district number one. I'll second, second that. And we need a date for this. Is that also? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, July 17th at the board meeting. That's fine. That's fine with mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So I'll include that in your yep. motion. Thank you. All right. And second, okay with that? Mm hmm. All right. Well, all those in favor then say aye. 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 So move so done. Perfect. All right. And mm -hmm. then I move that we adopt resolution number. Oh. 19-998, Resolution of Intention to Dissolve Improvement District Number 2, and set a public hearing for July 17th. I'll we'll second that as well. Discussion? Hearing none on all those in favor, Aye. 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 So move so done. Thank you. Um, also, I will point out that there is no requirement to put the map nor the legal <coughs> description in the newspaper, so those will not be in the newspaper. Only the resolutions themselves. Aye. Right, item number 10, consider replacement of ball and check valves as water meters and replace at the cost of $500,250 over five years. Yeah. yeah, big night for me, huh? Wow. Um, so we talked about this a bit um, earlier, and, and the good news is that we included this uh, in the budget that you already approved. So in anticipation of this, based on what we heard from both of the committees recommending. Um, we, as we've already indicated, we will be replacing our water meters over the next five years. Um, we have what is called a universal service connection. So back when we put in our radio read meters in the year 2000, we had all kinds of jungle plumbing out there. And every, every uh, meter had a different connection. We never knew quite what was out there. We didn't know what to expect. We didn't know how to describe it to the customers, what they were seeing. And so we came up with this universal connection, which includes a ball and a check valve. So it provides a low level backflow protection, but also the opportunity for a customer to turn off the, the valve on their side with without having to touch anything on our side of the meter. We want to keep them away from that side where, um, uh, you know, damage can, can uh, occur, costly damage can occur. And these um, ball and check valves don't last forever. They wear out over time. We've 
put them in you know 19 years ago and it would be most prudent and cost effective to replace them at this time the district you know has put that in for the customer use but it benefits us it creates um, it eliminates uh, a lot of breakage you know um, this is a way they can lock off their service they can turn off their service it's uh, it's beneficial to them and it provides much better customer service and field response for us so it's win-win all the way around um, the board approved the funding for the meter replacement program uh, total including 10 percent contingency 1.478 million we have a two and a half million dollar funding stream through our rate study for this project if we add this additional five hundred thousand thousand two hundred and fifty dollars to that uh, budget we're still more than half a million dollars under the budget that was projected for this project so uh, once we get to the end and whatever money is left over we'll then just be able to transfer right into our capital improvement fund and we can move forward with with other work so um, you know, uh, staff recommends this as both um, prudent and um, timely you know we wouldn't want to go back a year after we put a new meter in and do this again. It's a, you know, the labor's a, the biggest part of this. Um, and they uh, wear out over time, and the problem is that we won't know when. You know, when does the backflow stop working, and, and then we have a problem. So we recommend this. It's within the budget, uh, the project budget, the, the rate study funding, and um, the operating and capital budget that you just approved. So happy to answer any questions. All right. I just had a question. Um, how many meters do we have currently? We have about 5,500 services, mm -hmm. but not all of them have meters installed. Okay. Yeah. Um, at last I remember, there were 4,500 meters. Roughly, yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, just doing the math real quick, that's about $111 each. Um, that's that's quite reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, when I looked at it, half a million dollar make me holler. It's, uh, that was a big number until you break it down. Yes. And better yet, we had uh, an extra half million uh, left over right. from right. what we were just talking about <coughs> earlier. So now I'm all of a sudden a lot happier. Comments from the... Uh Public. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make that move. All right. I'll second it. All right, so moved, uh, so seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 So moved, so done. Item number 11, District Council Report. Uh, Mr. Ch uh, Chairman, I have no need to render a open session report tonight. All right. Item 12, General now. Manager Report. Just a couple things. just want to advise the board that Cal, Cal OES and the Federal Energy Management Agency, FEMA, have both reviewed the emergency response plans and the uh, local hazard mitigation plan. They have approved them with, once the board appro approves and adopts them. So at the Ju cool. June 19th meeting, there will be two resolutions one adopting the emergency resolution uh, emergency response plan and one adopting the local hazard mitigation plan and uh be a short staff report with the resolutions and i intend to put them in the consent calendar um, both plans have been reviewed by staff they've been run through the ringer at oes and fema by gary sturdivan and uh, that's my intention so if you really want to have a look at the local hazard mitigation plan and the emergency response plan. Uh, let me know and, and we'll, we'll get a desk ready for you at the office. They're uh, somewhat uh, sensitive in nature and, and I'm not going to publish them in the newspaper. Um, so that's, that's just coming up. Uh, any concerns with that? Okay. And um, I'm going to defer to to uh, Mark for a water operations update and see if he mentions the water model. <laughs> so just a, a couple of keynotes to kind of go over where we're sitting uh, currently with our CRP program, and then also uh, 
where we're at with uh, recharge as well. So yet to date, uh, we've taken on 541 uh, acre feet, which is about 176 million gallons. Uh, recharge was shut down, as we heard earlier, uh, on May 29th uh, due to a leak on their 36-inch transmission line. Uh, quite a bit of drain down, as we discussed earlier. Uh, they had USA out there today and digging it up. They suspect it's a, a collar on a piece of pipe. Uh, obviously, we'll know more by tomorrow, which will, also will give us an idea of when we can get this back up and running. As it sits now, instead of uh, completing things in July, it's going to end up pushing us into August a little bit. So we'll keep you apprised of the schedule on that. Um, also, uh, we're nearing the end of our equipment purchases uh, uh, for our CIRP program. Uh, our dump truck uh, was actually purchased. Uh, the larger amount there, the $160,000 cost, also included a trailer that would be towed by that truck to pull the equipment around. So that's why you can see a large yeah. delta there from the, uh, the equipment cost to what we actually paid. So there's, there's $54,000 left there, basically. Uh, the water truck's been purchased, the 410, uh, our excavator. The front end loader, the motor grader, and the 20 foot uh, dump and pipe hauler, along with the broom and asphalt roller. So, all of those have uh, all been purchased and uh, all at the price that we had budgeted for as well. Uh, the harder piece of equipment that's been for us to find uh, over the course of this last year, just due to the high equipment demands, is the asphalt spreader. So, this is, will be what we use to come back over the trench and install our, our uh, one inch overlay cap, uh, two foot either side of the trench, basically. Uh, it's a real integral piece of equipment out there, especially on the paved roads. Uh, several years ago, we picked one of these up at uh, High Desert for about forty-five dollars to $50,000 range, which is what we put in the budget. There were several in there within that range that after looking at them, we had to pass on them. They needed too much work or too high of hours. And this is causing us to kind of go up in model years. Uh, we did find one that's only got 100 86 operating hours on it, which is basically brand new for that piece of machinery. It's in good working condition uh, that we're looking at purchasing now. Uh, that actually is $107,000 with uh, tax included on that, uh, which dives into our, uh, our contingency that we had installed there by $62,000. Uh, we have the asphalt zipper that's already purchased as well. And so down there at the bottom, uh, with that contingency uh, installed there, we have about $90,000 left over from what the board approved uh, at the July 18th board meeting. And uh, the trailer is not going to cost us $54,000. Uh, we've been looking at those and expecting it around 25 to 30. And so we expect to add another $20,000 onto that, that 90 there. So it's be well over $100,000 uh, under the budget with the contingency involved with it. Uh, we got all of our pipe in. So we got 25,000 linear feet of 8-inch pipe out there in the back. There's a good picture of it all wrapped up. I included this picture because we had discussed, uh, you know, how we'd stop any sun baking from occurring on the pipe. And so you can see it here all nice and wrapped up in a UV protectant. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Although we're not intending to have it there too long, so. <laughs> and then here's some of the material that we purchased as well. All of our new fire hydrants and, and valves and T's and all that good stuff, so. Got all of our material and, and pipe in to install the Saddlebrook project now. Then the, the bigger component of this has been the, the hiring process. Uh, I asked Sarah to put this together for us. Uh, we published, uh, she published in, in several different uh, areas the actual job descriptions and the, uh, the opportunities. Uh, it was internally on our website through Indeed, Simply Hired, Trovit, Glassdoors, and the U.S. Military Pipeline. Uh, for the five positions that we had, uh, we received 31 uh, applications for the lead, uh, two, 12 for Pipes 2 position, uh, 32 for the Pipes 1 position, 139 for the laborer, totaling 214 applications actually received during that whole process. So after going through all of those, uh, Sarah did a pre-screen uh, uh, for the interview, prior to the interview, of uh, 22 people, 25 qualified applicants. Uh, we held uh, 15 in-person interviews, uh, three for the lead, and then 13 uh, uh, involved with the pipes one or two or the labor position. Uh, we had one scheduled no-show. And uh, as we know, the lead is filled. And then as far as the other four positions for the pipe one and two and the laborers, we have uh, four job offers extended uh, for those remaining positions and hope to have those filled probably within the next couple of weeks. So. And that concludes that presentation. <laughs> but we also met today uh, to go over our water model. Uh, we had some uh, discrepancies in the amount of pipe that the district had as compared to what uh, GIS had uh, in the model through GUDEC. 
so after we've gone through that and gone back and forth and, and identified uh, truer numbers, uh, they were able to come up and actually give us a display of the water model. We ran through several of the uh, current projects that we have out, some mainline extensions, uh, and also uh, some having to do with the replacement of age zone and things like that. So it's going to be a, it, it is actually already a great tool for the district to be using. You know, as these projects come in, we can quickly tell whether or not we have the, uh, the capacity to feed certain projects based on their water demands moving forward and whether or not those projects involve uh, upgrading our infrastructure moving forward. So it's an important tool for the district to have. End of report. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions from uh, the uh, board and public? Yes, sir. Yes, I have a question about uh, the uh, positions of the uh, field personnel. Uh, it wasn't publicized in the newspaper, and I'd like to ask why. In the uh, advertising in the newspaper, local newspaper. Because the newspapers are one of the most inefficient ways to recruit a wide variety of applicants. Times are changing. Any other uh, comments, questions? Moving on to item number 13, Director's Comments Report, Public Outreach, Kathleen Bradford. Happy June to you all. Summer's here. Bye bye, cool weather. The heat is here and high water demand. It's the season for it, which is high demand on our pipes that haven't been replaced yet. So I encourage anyone listening and all our customers to keep vigilant and watching for leaks in the roads and wherever they drive and let us know as soon as they see something because this is the time of the year when everyone's using a lot more water for swamp coolers remember it's anywhere from six to thirteen gallons per hour when you're running your swamp cooler and outdoor fun and play in the water and of course those uh, increased watering for your landscape and the irrigation systems that break because the animals eat your lines. So all of those reasons to be watching and monitoring your water meter leak detector so that you aren't surprised by a water bill that is not because of our rate changes, it's because you have a leak. Spread the word. Also, uh, at the farmer's market this month, we are talking about the aquifer and it coincides with the recharging that we're doing and finding a lot of interest. I thought we'd have an easy month after the tortoises, but it appears to be quite interesting to a lot of the people walking by. Tom's there. We thought we were going to have a break. <laughs> but a lot of people just still do not comprehend the concept of an aquifer. So we're out there, and we're explaining and talking about recharge and everything tied to it, and explaining also that um, Kudos to our community. They have managed to continue to conserve water, and therefore, that has impacted our water. Do, we don't have our latest rates of conservation, do we? It's too soon. June. Um, it's probably too soon. We have one more week to go. But regardless, through the past months, it's been evident. We have, as a community, been conserving water, even though the declared drought is over. So uh, we talk about that out there and still having a lot of newbies coming in, interested in coming in, and just people who are starting to ask questions. So it's turning out to be an interesting topic out there at the Farmer's Market on Saturday mornings. Lastly, June 29th from 4 to 9 p.m. Saturday at the Josh Tree Community Center, we will be participating in their new... Uh, rotary subsidized or hosted community event. Uh, they're not going to do a parade. They're going to just do this big bands and beer and community come on in here type event. We will be there, but we will be teaching on water conservation during summertime when water is high as we monitor the water dunk tank. So I should have an audience. <laughs> Don't worry, I didn't volunteer any of you <laughs> to be on the wet seat. 
So that being said, I uh, want to also remind everyone, because this is hot weather, and because it is high water use season, and because we still have pipes that break on dem under this high demand, please store emergency water. It's that time of year, and plus Southern California is looking at a lot of earthquake activity just right now as I speak. So don't let it escape you. Let it be top of the mind awareness. Thank you. Thank you. Item 14, uh, future director meetings and training opportunities. TAC uh, meeting has moved, I think, I have a note here, to June 18th. So mm -hmm. Director Lutman takes take notice. Finance Committee, uh, June 12th. Water Resources, June 12th. We may uh, have some other word on that as we go around on times. And, uh, Mojave Water Agency, Board of Directors, June 13th. <laughs> Director Reynolds. Uh, Association of uh, San Bernardino County Special District's dinner is June 17th, and that will be uh, in his area. I'll take uh, director's comments if they want to do it now. We're moving into item 15, so I will <laughs> let us do that now if you'd like. Director Hunt, we'll start with you. Um, Kathleen, talking about storing water just reminded me I, I often notice when I go into either Home Depot or Walmart, how convenient those five gallon jugs of water are. And you can just pick one up when you're going to shop. And uh, I made a habit of starting to uh, grab a couple of those um, when I made trips into town. And I re would really encourage people to do it. That one time that you really need it, you'll be so glad that you uh, stored some decent quantities of water at your home. So, and, and Kathleen, didn't you say that you shouldn't put the plastic things directly on concrete? Correct. Uh, apparently, the lime or whatever it is that's in concrete, as hard as it appears, can still leach through plastic, which mm. is semi porous. You know, it doesn't need water. It can leach through, is my training. Uh, they really recommend you put it at least on a board or a carpet or anything. Yeah, anything other than directly on concrete. Uh, thank you. Um, on the subject of storing water, um, it's also a good idea to rotate your stock and uh, keep the water fresh. As, as you store water after quite some time, it will get stale and uh, won't be very fun. In case of an emergency, you have to drink that stuff. Um, so rotate your stock. Keep it fresh. Um, I'd like to thank Jim Ventura for, for coming and, mm -hmm. and bringing along uh, Tom, the new guy. He's still the new guy in my book. I miss Kirby. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate the, um, your attendance and, and the uh, presentation you gave. And also, uh, it's a nice gesture for Kurt. And uh, I'm glad to see you're here. I do remember that Basin Wide Foundation when Kurt gave his introductory talk on where water comes from, how the rain came and it dripped down the tusk of the mammoth. He was there. He was there. That's what he said. He was there. It goes into the moment. ground. And so 18,000 years later, we're, we're pumping it out of the aquifer. And this is the water we have today. He learned real good where the water comes from. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I will uh, just add that uh, remember that uh, our, our first responders and those that uh, serve our community, we want to make sure that they're always in our thoughts and our prayers, and D-Day is just uh, on us. Uh, thank you for this country that we live in, and thank you for the staff and all the hard work that you do. Item 15 is a closed session. At this time, the board will go into a closed session pursuant to Government Code Section 54957. Discuss and consider the appointment and employment of acting interim general manager and effective calling uh, Mr. Sauer's scheduled retirement and to consult with the board's designated representative ad hoc negotiating committee members, uh, President Johnson, Director Reynolds, pursuant to code section 54957.6, the potential compensation for said position acting on this matter will be considered in open session at the June 19th, 2019 regular board directors meetings. And with that, I will close the meeting.